camera's on. And I am starting the audio. Sorry. In three, two, one. Okay. It's actually connected to the snowball this time. I'm not gonna make the same mistake twice. Okay. Episode 11. Horror Log. Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Lady Kira's Galactic Adventure, where we traverse the universe in our Corellian Corvette Cruiser the Vindicator. I am, of course, your host on this excursion, Admiral Kira Vondare of the Alliance to Restore the Republic. Sadly, we will not be joined by our resident Jedi Padawan slash part-time tour guide, Arisi Nell, for the next few weeks, as she's off on a mission with her master on Kashyyyk. I apologize for not posting, but I needed some time off to deal with my mental health and celebrate Thanksgiving along with many of my other American followers, I'm sure. This time we are continuing our exploration of the interior as we travel to the planet Coralog. <laughs> if you have no questions, comments, or concerns, then make sure to ride your motorcycles like a banter. <laughs> motorbikes like a banter fall in love with millions of men with the exact same face and dramatically scream no when you find out the identity of your long lost father this week on Lady Kira's Galactic Adventure. Korolag is located like the planets in the last two episodes in the Bormia sector at L9 in the Galactic Grid but also happens to reside in the Cormula system so you know what that means. It's system time, baby! The Coralus system is centered around a single sun, Coralus, which I have no information on. So let's head over to the first orbital position out of four to talk about something with a record on the holonet. <clears throat> what was that? There's no information on the first planet either. Uh, do we at least know its name? I'm sorry about that, folks. In the first orbital position, we have Solag, which sadly <laughs> has no further information. Galaxy known. <laughs> so uh, let's proceed through the system. In the second orbital position of the Coyla system, we have Beelag, one of two gas giants with seven moons, all named Daryl. If you don't understand that reference, listen to episodes back when we talked about the Brentor system, also in the Bormia sector. Um, it's a stupid inside joke, which you can totally be a part of if you spare me a few listens and maybe a review while you're at it. Now everyone, I have a query for you. Why is it that gas giants have so many moons while all terrestrial planets can have little to none at all? Listeners, if you wish to answer this question and you happen to be listening on Spotify, there's a little Q&A pop-up where you can feel free to input your answers if you wish. Ah. Uh, Modern technology. Back to my question though, given that you have paused this and put in your answer if you can and or want to, I think it is time for an answer which is going to be very anticlimactic. <laughs> Gas giants, keyword giants, have more moons on average than normal sized terrestrial planets due to their size and consequently stronger gravitational fields. And bringing this back to Earth for a quick second, according to Newton's law of universal gravitation, uh, the force of gravity, F, is equal to the gravitational constant, capital G, which is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th power, times the product of mass 1 times mass 2, divided by the distance between the center of the two masses squared. As you can see, mass is directly related to gravity, which explains why gas giants are more likely to acquire moons as more and more celestial objects get stuck in their gravitational pull and into their atmosphere. Physics is actually really interesting, and maybe this could be an excuse for me to flex whatever I can remember from it from high school. <laughs> The Coyula system does exist though, <laughs> and we have two more planets to cover, so let's keep moving forward. In the third orbital position is the planet Garalag, the second and final gas giant in the system with five moons, all named Daryl of course, and no other data, so that means it's time to head over to the main attraction, Coralag. Coralag is satisfyingly the fourth and final planet in the Coyula system. 
In canon, it was home to the Koryalag Military Academy, an Imperial Service Academy that supplied troops and personnel to the Imperial military. Fun fact, in order to become a cadet at an Imperial Academy, one needed to be 16 years of age. So even the imps were harboring child soldiers after creating a smear campaign against the Jedi for doing the same thing. Some things never change, I guess. Although there is not much information on it in canon, we do know that Coralag was a mining planet, since some mining corporations that were based on it branched out and had colonies, for lack of a better word, on Iriadu in the Outer Rim, which led to an overall increase in the extraction of Lomite. Kira, what's Lomite? Great question! <laughs> Lomite is a type of ore needed to make transparent steel, and if your next question is going to be, what is transparent steel, then I'm just going to ask you to go and listen to the episode on Ojom and Volpter and all those other planets, I don't remember the name of it, uh, <laughs> where I do a bit of a deep dive into transparent steel for all of you beautiful people. Due to Coralang's influence on Iriadu, the planet, once lush and green, was transformed into populated industrial zones and poverty-stricken cities, which also happens to a planet in that episode that I just mentioned, Volpta. And I go on a, a rant there also about the effects of industrialization and pollution and how Volpta's story should be a warning for the future of Earth slash Terra slash whatever you want to call it space-wise. <laughs> um, but that's everything I have for you in canon, so we're gonna hop right on over to Legends. Coralag has a rotation period of 25 standard hours and an orbital period of 371 standard days. The standard being based on the Coruscant cycle, of course. For more information on Coruscant and the Coruscant cycle, you should go listen to the Coruscant episode, which I worked, I worked very hard on. And I know it's long, but it is worth it if you like listening to me lose my mind. Coralag is a terrestrial planet with a type 1 breathable atmosphere, a temperate climate, and standard gravity. I've mentioned a lot of planets uh, with a type 1 breathable atmosphere, and I know you've been thinking from the beginning, <laughs> what is a type 1 breathable atmosphere and are there others? If you want to see the smirk on my face, you can go check out the video version of this show on youtube.com, but let's get into it. The vast majority of planets where sentient life exists in the galaxy are based in carbon compounds with water as a solvent. The atmospheres that evolved from these situations usually contain a mixture of oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Planets like this almost always develop some kind of indigenous life, sentient or otherwise. Uh, and then are naturally refreshed by the, by the plant life or some other chemical reaction that converts oxygen into a breathable form, hence why type 1 atmospheres are breathable. If oxygen was not converted into this breathable form, it would succumb to its tendency to cling to other elements and substances, potentially creating an atmosphere not conducive to life. Now, type 2 breathable atmospheres are those in which it is recommended that humans or humanoid creatures wear breath masks. Planets such as these usually contain enough oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere to maintain and support life for its native species, but non-native species may not always have an easy time adjusting to the pressure of the atmosphere or contaminants in it, which may cause harm to them. I've heard the symptoms are attuned to altitude sickness or choking as if one breathed in smoke or other such pollutants. Next is the type 3 breath mask essential atmosphere. Planets with type 3 atmospheres are sometimes capable of supporting native life, but it is uncommon that it could support much non-native. Humans in this type of environment experience immediate or gradual discomfort, which may lead to an inca incapacitation sorry, and long-term health effects for the rest of their lives if they do not have the proper equipment of breath masks to protect themselves. Lastly, there is one more type of atmosphere. Type 4, environment suit required. Planets with these kinds of environments tend to have incredibly thin atmospheres to the point where they are nearly non-existent. And it has been confirmed that all type 4 atmospheres are able to kill or incapacitate most species, which can be prevented with the use of an environment suit, which contains their own hermetically sealed environments. Hence why they're called environment suits. <laughs> For reference, this one goes out to all my Clone Wars fans. If you 
couldn't remember all the way back to season one, I believe it was, to the Blue Shadow Virus arc. Ahsoka and the 501st members that were with her, I can really only remember Rex, um, were sick. But Padme Amidala and Jar Jar Binks were not at first, at first, uh, due to their use of environment suits, which protected them only until they were ripped by I don't remember what I think it's Jar Jar. Those things should be made out of Kevlar or something to stop the Jar Jar of it all from happening in the Jar Jar. For uh, even I, Kira Von Dade, have certified Jar Jar Binks moments, and I'm sure you will do too. That's it on all the different atmosphere types, so let's get back to the mystery of the planet. After a quick water break. Coralag was a cool world with a mostly human population, with a few Wookiees, Aqualish, Ithorians, and Silkcats as well. This planet was colonized when, under the Rakatan domination, the humans of Coruscant sent out sleeper ships to colonize distant worlds. These sleeper ships ended up throughout the galaxy, in locations such as Coralag, Alderaan, the Tion Cluster, Sail 5, Quat, Alsakan, which we've already talked about, Algani, Axum, Anaxis, uh, Atresia, Metellos, and many, many others. We talked a lot about the Rakatan Infinite Empire in my favourite episode that I have ever done uh, on Tifthan, which is criminally underviewed. <laughs> so do a girl a favour and go listen to it, please. We talked about Mandal the Mandalorian and Grogu and Ahsoka Tano and the precursors to the Jedi Order and Kane and Jarrus and the Bendu and different religions and Star Wars. It was so much fun. Coralag was an early member of the Galactic Republic and was the site of a battle in the First Great Schism, in which Jedi, I'm going to say this wrong, Danzigoro Parts slew his own master, Jokjo Kibrozen, who had joined the legions of Latau through other Dark Jedi, though other Dark Jedi escaped, sorry, including Blendiri and her Padawan. Sorry. <laughs> It sounds like the Jedi are going to give the Christians a run for their money. <laughs> we will be getting into the schisms one day. But only when one of you tells me to, along with the Yuzon Vong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fun fact! Coralog was also well known for its swoop races, which are basically just speeder races, which is kind of cool because this is hard racing. <laughs> Another fun fact! During the times of the Empire, Sinar fleet systems themselves developed the TIE ADX-7 at the Sinar Advanced Research Division on Corolla. Pretty cool. Near the end of the New Sith Wars, the world was captured by the Brotherhood of Darkness, we've talked about that before, like many other planets in the Vomir Sector. Do you remember when I mentioned Ariadne before? and the uh, Transparis jail and all that stuff. Well, in 900 BBY, five powerful families from Coralag called the Quintal left Coralag to the backwater planet of Eriadu, where they turned the planet into, quote, the Coruscant of the Outer Rim. Weird flex, but okay. Um, Coralag remains loyal to the Galactic Republic during the Clone Wars, but it was represented by Senator Zaphiel Snops. Coralag, unlike other planets in the Vormir sector, was represented independently. All others were represented at that time by Senator Mon Mothma. After the Empire took over, the planet's population was extremely loyal to Palpatine, and its behavior was pointed out as a model imperial behavior, which is why there's an academy there. During this time, Coralag was home to numerous prisons which all held enemies of the Galactic Empire. The conditions of those prisons, I do not know. Coralag boasted orbital research stations over its surface, on which important work on the Death Star project was done, and also happens to be where rebel forces first confirmed the project's ex existence after a successful raid. Under the Empire, Coralag was extremely influential, but after the death of the Emperor, the planet lost much of its influence. And due to its close ties with his new order, few members of the New Republic Senate were eager to provide aid to the world, and rightfully so. Coralag capitulated to the Izon Vong after the Battle of Coruscant, whatever that means, and I'm not getting into this now, as I've said before. 
And that is everything that I have for you on Coralike and the Coralist system in both canon and legends. And if you enjoyed your journey this week and you'll stay so far aboard the Vindicator. If you have any questions or concerns about your stay, feel free to bring it up with one of our personnel on board via a private message or a DM. Perhaps on our TikTok accounts at Janet Collective Rules or at Unidentified Robot, or maybe our Instagram at Lady Kira, or perhaps with a review of our show. All of those usernames and their respective platforms will be listed in the show notes. Next time, we will be journeying to Skako. And it might be the same Skako you and I are thinking about right now. Uh, and whatever cool worlds I can cover in an hour or less. Until next time, my friends, companions, and droids. May the Force be with you all. Yeah.